Hi, this is Pastor Darren at Amazing Grace Community Church. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, shout out to all the moms out there, past, present, and future. We are so incredibly blessed to have you in our lives. We appreciate you so much. Hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful Mother's Day so far. I wanted to share some things that famous mothers might have said. Paul Revere's mother I don't care where you think you have to go, young man. Midnight is past your curfew. Mona Lisa's mother. After all that money your father and I spent on braces, Mona, that's the best smile you can give us? Humpty Dumpty's mother. Humpty, if I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times, don't sit on that wall. But would you listen to me? No. Columbus's mother. I don't care what you've discovered, Christopher. You still could have written. Michelangelo's mother. Mike, can't you paint on walls like other children? Do you have any idea how hard it is to get that stuff off the ceiling? Batman's mother. It's a nice car, Bruce, but do you realize how much the insurance is going to be? Goldilocks' mother. I got a bill here for a busted chair from the Bear family. Do you know anything about that, Goldie? Albert Einstein's mother. But Albert, it's your senior picture. Can you please do something with your hair? Jonah's mother. That's a nice story, Jonah, but now tell me where you really were for the last three days. And Thomas Edison's mother. Of course, I'm proud that you invented the electric light bulb, Thomas. Now turn off that light and get to bed. Maybe you heard some of those comments from your own mothers at times. Well, today we're going to continue our study in characters in the Bible. And I want to take a look at another famous mother. Uh, several weeks ago, we looked at Abraham and the life of Abraham. And today we're going to take a look at Abraham's wife his wife, Sarah. I invite you to grab your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, as we continue our study, we're going to take a look at Sarah. And by the way, my message today is not just for the ladies, it's for all of us, because there's so much that we all can, can take from this lesson. So let's pray, and then we'll dig in. Father, thank you again for our mothers. Thank you for the love that they have shown toward us. Thank you most of all for the love that you have shown toward us. Thank you for giving us your word where we can open it and we can read your love letter to us and we can know you better through it. And I pray that uh, we would do that today. I pray that we would hunger and thirst for your word and that you would speak to us as only you can. And may we be obedient to your word Thank you for the privilege of gathering together around your word. We pray in the name of our Savior Jesus, by his Spirit. Amen. Now, I want to take a brief journey through Sarah's life first, and then we're going to take a look at some lessons that we all can learn from her life. And we see the first record of Sarah, or Sarai, in Genesis chapter 11. Genesis 11 Verse 29 says, Abram and Nahor both married. And the name of Abram's wife was Sarah, or Sarai. And verse 30 says, now Sarai was barren. She had no children. And back in that day, barrenness and childlessness was a horrible curse, even worse than today. So the primary role of women back in those days was to bear children. They, having children ensured their family line would continue. It, it ensured that they would carry on a legacy. It also gave them uh, people who would take care of them in their old age. Having children in those days was a critical thing. And here was Sarai rapidly approaching old age. And she was barren. But God had a plan. Look at Genesis chapter 12. Verse 1, 
Genesis 12, 1, the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Now, that in itself was a great sacrifice for Abram and Sarai, and yet they went. And the Lord said in verse 2 of Genesis 12, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And in verse 3, he says, All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. An incredible promise. So Abram left Haran when he was 75 years old. Now that would have made Sarai 65 years old. And yet they left. Take a look at verse 11 of Genesis chapter 12. Verse 11, it says, As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. I love that verse. She is a 65-year-old senior citizen, and she's beautiful. And he goes on to say in verse 12, When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and then they will kill me, but let you live. So say you're my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. And when Abram came to Egypt, sure enough, the Egyptians saw that, he was a, that she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. Now, try to imagine what is going through Sarai's mind at this point. She's married to Abraham, and now she's in Pharaoh's harem. And yet, she trusted, and she obeyed her husband, and she kept quiet. Well, the story goes on that Pharaoh eventually finds out, and he gives her back to Abram along with lots of animals and servants. Apparently, Abram doesn't really learn his lesson here because, as we're going to see later, he does this again. But in the meantime, Sarai gets impatient, <laughs> don't we all? She knew the promise that she and Abraham were going to be the beginning of a new nation, and yet she's still barren. So she gets impatient and she, she decides to take matters into her own hands. I mean, after all, her time herself for having children is over now, humanly speaking. And so we see in Genesis chapter 16 that Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children, so go and sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, in ancient customs, that was a common practice. It was acceptable because, again, it was all about having lots of children. So Abram agrees with her, and Hagar becomes pregnant. Whoops. Look at verse 4 of chapter 16. When she knew she was pregnant, Hagar began to despise her mistress. I believe that she mocked Sarai because Sarai was still barren. You see, this, this curse of barrenness continued to haunt her. And in verse 5, Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for this. You're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering, Abram. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May Yahweh judge between you and me, Abram. I would love to know why is it always the husband's fault? The problem is both of them had a lapse of faith. Both of them got impatient and they preempted God's plan for them. And unfortunately, because of their impatience, their offspring, uh, Isaac, who, who was the, the, the founder of the Jews, and Ishmael with the Arabs, 
They have been fighting ever since for thousands of years because of Abraham and Sarah's impatience. Now in Genesis 17, we see a, a key turning point here in their lives. God changes their names to reflect his promise and his blessing. In Genesis 17, verse 15, it says, God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. Sarah. See, the name change reflected God's blessings on them. Sarah means my princess. My princess. What a prophetically fitting name for this future matriarch. And look at what God says in verse 16. He says, I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. And Abraham fell face down and he laughed. Make note of that. He laughed. And he said to himself, will, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? I mean, Abraham naturally doubts God. And then in verse 19, God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son. And you will call him laughter. Isaac. That's what it means. Now, try to imagine what Sarah is thinking right now. As she hears this promise, she's going to have a baby at 90 years old. And then we look at Genesis chapter 18, where God visits Abraham near Mamre, and Abraham runs to get a meal for them. Look at uh, chapter uh, 18, verse 6 of Genesis. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah, and he said, quick, get 20 quarts of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. And then he goes out to get a new calf and, and, and to have that prepared for a meal too. Ladies, how would you love to uh, prepare an impromptu feast for some uninvited guests? No notice, nothing at a time, start baking. Well, Sarah Harry hurries to prepare the meal and then she hides in the doorway to eavesdrop. In Genesis 18, verse 10, the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening in the entrance to the tent, which was behind him, and Abraham and Sarah were already old, well advanced in years, Sarah was past the age of childbearing, so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? Nice choice of words. Hmm. But again, she has a moment of disbelief. She doubted God's word. And in verse 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? He goes on to say, I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Now, Sarah was afraid now. So she lied, and she said, I, I, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, oh, yes, you did. Have you ever tried to lie your way out of trouble? Yeah, doesn't end well, does it? She was busted, and she knew it. So Abe and Sarah then have a few months to get busy, get ready to have a kid. And yet, look what happens in the meantime. Genesis chapter 20. 
in Genesis 20, once again, Abraham pawns her off as his sister. And now she's added to Abimelech's harem. And mind you, she is possibly pregnant at this time and is 90 years old. She still is beautiful at 90 years old. Notice, by the way, why Sarah agrees to have this done, agrees to go with Abimelech. Look at verse 13 of Genesis 20. It says, When God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, this is Abraham speaking, he says, I said to her, this is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. See, Sarah allows herself to be taken into another harem. She does it to spare her husband's life because she loves him. She loves him. Well, once again, Abe gets rich off this lie, and they move on once again. By the way, let me say this, guys, it's not okay to get rich off your wives, okay? Not a good thing. Not a good thing to pawn them off as your sister. And then we come to Genesis chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. And Abraham gave the name Isaac, laughter, to the son that Sarah bore him. And in verse 6, Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. And everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? And yet I have borne him a son in his old age. You see, her laughter turns from disbelief to belief to joy. To joy. God answered her prayers in ways she couldn't even begin to imagine. She gave birth to the future nation of Israel, to the future Messiah, Christ Jesus. It's an incredible, miraculous moment. But all is not well in paradise. Look down at chapter 21, verse 9. Chapter 21, verse 9 says, But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. Ishmael was mocking Isaac. And so she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. See, now that she has her son of promise, she doesn't want anything to do with her surrogate son. Sarah is very protective now of this long-awaited son. And so she urges Abraham to send away his other wife and son. And reluctantly, he does so. He sends Hagar and Ishmael off to become their own nation. And then we see in chapter 23 that Sarah lived to be 127 years old. And she died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. In fact, Abraham buys his first plot of land in the promised land as a burial plot for his wife. This beautiful yet humble woman waited her whole life for God to work a miracle in her. And as a result of her faith, God rewarded her more than any woman in that day. 
Yes, her faith stumbled at times, but God came through and he still rewarded her. In fact, Sarah's name is forever etched in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 11 says, By faith even Sarah, who was past age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. It's a beautiful story of a beautiful woman, even as a senior citizen. So what can we learn then from the account of Sarah? I want to share with you 10 lessons that we can learn from Sarah's life. And again, these lessons are not just for the women. These are for all of us to learn. Lesson number one. You are beautiful in God's sight. You are beautiful in God's sight. Even when she was 90 years old, Sarah still had it. She was still beautiful. Folks, there's hope for all of us, okay? In fact, 1 Peter chapter 3 speaks of the beauty in, of women in relation to Sarah. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Um, Peter is teaching the church and he says, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. That's the beauty that God sees. He sees our inner heart. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. And you are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Guys, make sure your wife knows she is beautiful, no matter how old she is. Make sure she knows she's beautiful. And ladies, remember, you will always be beautiful in God's eyes. Number one, you are beautiful in God's sight. Here's the second lesson. Our trials can be God's triumph. Our trials can be God's triumph. You see, Sarah was never told why she was barren. It was a horrible curse for her that she carried almost all her life. And yet God used it as a display of grace and power and his sovereign plan for mankind. Her barrenness led to a miracle child who became the forefather to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. You know, we may never know why bad things happen, we may never fully understand why this coronavirus is struck and the you know, quarantine and all that. We may never know why trials happen to us. But we can always, always know that God has a plan for good. He does. Our trials can be God's triumph. In fact, the third lesson we can learn from Sarah is that God has a plan for our lives. God has a plan for our lives. You may be familiar with the, the passage in Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God has a plan for our lives. God loves you. Trust him. Trust him to work your trials into triumph. Trust him to use you in ways you cannot begin to imagine. God has a plan for your life. And then here's the fourth lesson we can learn. 
don't get ahead of God. Don't get ahead of God. See, Sarah knew of God's promise, but she got tired waiting. She got impatient. She took matters into her own hands. And Israel and the Arabs have been fighting ever since. You see, when we get ahead of God, or when we lag behind him, the results can be disastrous. They really can. We need to trust his plan, his timing. And that means we need to wait patiently. We need to walk closely with the Lord and trust his plan. Don't get ahead of God. Here's the fifth lesson. Don't blame others for your sin. Don't blame others for your own sin. Back in Genesis 16, Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. It's all your fault, Abram. No, it wasn't. She told him to sleep with Hagar. It's just as much her fault. So don't blame others for your own mess-ups, your own failures, your own sins. It's not their fault. Take responsibility. Own up to it. Man up. And then repent of the sin. Get back on the path that God has chosen for you. Don't blame others for your own sin. The sixth lesson we can learn from Sarah Always be ready to encounter God. Always be ready to encounter God. Back in Genesis 18, God suddenly showed up at Abraham's door to reassure them of his promise. You know, we never know when God is planning to turn our trials into triumph. We never know when God is about to break out in wonderful ways. We never know when God is planning to speak powerfully through his word. We never know when God is going to grab hold of us in an incredible way and change our lives. We need to be ready. We need to be like young Samuel when he said, Speak, Lord, your servant's listening. Your servant is ready. Always be ready for God to show up in an incredible way. Always be ready for an encounter with God. Here's the seventh lesson we can learn from Sarah. Don't doubt God's word. Don't doubt God's word. See, when Sarah overheard this miraculous news, she thought, oh, this is too good to be true. She couldn't believe it. She said, oh, not now. It's, it's too late. I'm worn out. God is finished with me. Friend, if you have a pulse, then God is not finished with you. He's not. Don't doubt God's word. He has staked his life and his reputation on it. He will come through. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it, period. God always keeps his promises, even if they seem impossible. Don't doubt God's word. The eighth lesson we can learn from Sarah is love your spouse. Love your spouse. Sarah lied for Abraham to show her love for him. Now, we may obviously disagree with his plan and his, his thought process, but we cannot doubt her love and loyalty to him. Her demonstration of love was done to protect him. And we all need to demonstrate real love to our spouses. We need to protect them. We need to cherish them. We need to let them know they're loved. In fact, showing real love in action 
is one of the best ways to protect our marriages. Love your spouse as Sarah loved Abraham. The ninth lesson we can learn from Sarah is protect your children. Protect your children. Back in Genesis 21, Sarah said to Abraham, get rid of the slave woman and her son. That slave woman's son is never going to share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. And again, we may disagree with her plan and her motive, but we can't deny her love for her son. She wanted to protect him. She wanted to protect his inheritance. And parents, we must do the same, right? We need to protect our children at all costs. Now, more than ever, they are under attack from the enemy, and he's picking them off like flies. I think one of the greatest enemies out there is social media and the Internet. And too many of our kids have free access to things they should never be seeing. And the enemy is, is roaring about, sneaking about, destroying our children. We need to protect them at all costs. We need to ensure that our kids are safe and sound. Protect your children. And then the 10th lesson we can learn from the life of Sarah is take time to laugh. Take time to laugh. Abraham's and Sarah's laughter of disbelief turned into laughter of joy. Sarah says in Genesis 26, 21 verse 6, she says, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. Folks, laughter is great medicine. It really is, especially when it's a result of God's work in our lives. So let me ask you, how has God brought you laughter? How has God made you laugh? How has he blessed you? How has he shown up in some surprising way? How is his plan for you unfolding? Take time to laugh, especially when times are tough, especially when we're holed up in this quarantine. Take time to laugh. Take time to trust in and rejoice in God's good promises to you, in his plan for you. Sarah was not perfect. Nobody was except for Jesus. Her faith faltered at times, but God still came through for her. And I want to tell you, God will always come through for us, too, if we trust him and let him do things his way in his timing. There are so many lessons that we can learn from the life of Sarah, but I think we can Con consolidate them down, shrink them down into three short little statements. I think this is the, the bottom line of Sarah's life. Three statements. Trust him, wait on him, and laugh with him. Trust him, wait on him, and laugh with him. Rejoice in the Lord always. In all circumstances, even in your trials. I pray that we would take time to laugh today and rejoice in God's goodness. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for laughter. Thank you for a cheerful heart that's good medicine. Thank you for your word that that teaches us so much. And I pray that, that we would continue to trust you and your timing, that we would wait patiently on you, that we would stay in step with you. Father, I pray that, that our lives would reflect the joy that we have in Christ 
and that you would continue to use us in ways we can't even begin to imagine. Remind us to trust you and to wait on you and to laugh with you. And Father, again, I pray for that person who may be watching right now. Maybe they've never had an encounter with God before. Maybe they, they've been going to church or going through the motions, but they've never experienced the incredible forgiveness and love of their Savior. Father, if, if that's true, I, I pray right now that you would grab hold of them, that you would convict their spirit. I pray that they would cry out in their heart right now and say, God, I need that encounter with you. I need you. I realize that I'm a mess without you. I'm a wretch without you. I deserve your wrath, but I beg you to save me. I beg you to forgive me and change me, that I would be able to experience that joy that I just heard about. Would you save me, Lord? Father, I pray that every person watching this and listening to this today would know without a doubt that they're your child, that they have confessed their sins and, and been saved by the precious blood of Jesus. And I pray that it would cause all of us to rejoice and to laugh with you as you unfold your plan for us. Thank you, Father, for what you have done, what you're doing, what you're going to do. And thank you also for mothers. We pray in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. I trust and pray that God would continue to bless you today and tomorrow and the next day. And by the way, if today is the day that you gave your heart to Jesus, would you please let me know, message me, send me an email, let me know. I want to rejoice and laugh together with you. Be blessed as you go forth and celebrate your mothers. Have a great week.